Hello and welcome to this CUBE Conversation. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE here in Palo Alto, California, beginning in 2022, kicking off the new year with a great conversation. We're with folks from Down Under, two co-founders of InstaCluster, Pete Lilly, CEO, Ben Brumhead, the CTO, InstaCluster Success. Cubby's been on the CUBE before 2018 at Amazon reInvent. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on the CUBE. Thanks for uh, piping in from Down Under into Palo Alto. Oh, th thanks, John. It's really good to be here. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. So I love the name of Insta, Insta Cluster. You know, the, it, it conjures up cloud, cloud scale, um, modern applications, serverless. It's just, it's just, it just gives me a feel of like things coming together, spin me up a cluster, uh, these kinds of, you know, feelings. The cloud is here, open source is growing. That's what you guys are in the middle of. Take a minute to explain what you guys do real quick and this open source cloud intersection that's just going supernova right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so look, InstaCluster is on a, a mission to really enable the world's ambitions to use open source technology. And we do that specifically at the data layer. Um, and, and we primarily do that through what we call our platform offering. And think of it as, as the way to make it super easy, super scalable, super reliable, uh, way to adopt open source technologies at the data layer to build cutting edge applications in the cloud. Uh, today, you know, used by customers all over the world. We started the business in Australia, but we've, you know, very quickly become a, a global global business. But we are the business that sits behind some of the most successful brands that are building, you know, massively scalable cloud based applications. And you're dead right. Um, we sit at a, at a real intersection of kind of four themes. One is um, one is open source adoption, which is an incredibly powerful journey uh, and a wave that's kind of driving, you know, the future direction of IT. Uh, you've got managed services or managed operations, and you know, moving those onto a platform like InstaCluster. You've got uh, the adoption of cloud, and cloud is a wave that, like open source, is a wave. Um, and then you've got growth of data. You know, everything is so data driven these days that uh, and data is is just the business and, and our customers and in a lot of cases when we work with our customers on Insta cluster today it's it's you know the application and the data the data is the business Ben I want to get your thoughts as a CTO because open source and technology and cloud has been a real game changer if you go back prior to cloud open source is very awesome still great you know, freedom, you know, we got code. It's just the scale of open source and then cloud came along, can't change the game. So open source and then new business models became, so commercial open source software is, is now an industry. It's not just open mm. source, hey, free software. And then maybe a Red Hat's out there or someone like a Red Hat will have some premium support. There's been innovation on the business model side. So matching technology innovation with the business model has been a big change in the past, you know, many, many years. And this past year in particular, that's been key. And open source, open core, these are the things that are people talking about, license changes. This is a big mm -hmm. discussion because you could be on the wrong side of history if you make the wrong decision here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think it's also worth, I guess, taking a step back and, and understanding a little bit about what, you know, like why have people gravitated towards open source uh, and the cloud beyond, you know, the kind of the hippie freedoms of, oh, you know, I can see the code and I have ownership and, you know, everything's free and great. Um, and, and I think the reason why it's really taken off in a commercial setting, in an enterprise setting is velocity, right? You know, how much easier is it to go reach and grab a open source tool that you can download, you can grab, you can compile yourself, you can make it work the way you want it to do to solve a, a problem here and now versus the old school way of doing it, which is with, you know, oh, I have to go download a trial version. Oh no, some of the features are locked. I've got to go talk to a procurement or a salesperson, uh, you know, to kind of go and solve the problem that I have. And then I've got to get that approved by, uh, you know, my own purchasing department. And do we have budget? And, you know, all of a sudden it's like way, way, way harder to solve the problem in front of you as an engineer. Whereas with open source, I just go grab it and I move on. Right, you know, I, I've achieved something for the day. Right, yeah. All um, that so friction, I think that basically like, all that friction that comes out. I, I, like, you got a problem to solve? Oh, open source. I'm gonna just get a hammer and hammer that nail. Wait a minute, whoa, whoa! I gotta stand in line. I gotta jump over hoops. I gotta do all these things. This is the hassle and friction. Exactly, and, and this is why it's often called, you know, um, you know, one 
the, the most impressive things about that. And I think on the cloud side, it's the same thing, but for hardware and capability and compute and memory, right? You know, previously, if you wanted compute, right? Oh, you got to lodge a ticket. You got to ask someone to rack a server in a data center. You know, you got to deal with three different departments. Oh my goodness, you know, how painful is that just to get a server up to go run and do something, right? That's, that's just pulling your hair out. Whereas with the cloud, that's an API call, right? Or clicking a few buttons on a console, right? And off you go. You now combine those two things. And I would say that software engineers are probably the most productive they've ever been, uh, you know, in, in the last 20 years, right? You know, I know sometimes it doesn't look like that, um, but their ability to solve problems in front of them, uh, you know, especially using external, you know, stuff, um, is is way 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 better. Well, right? I think you're under. I so think when you're you put under, those two under, things together, you get right any... there. I mean, the fact of the matter is, they are productive. They're putting security into the code, right in the CI/CD pipeline. So I mean, this is highly agile right mm -hmm. now. So you know, coders are highly productive and efficient and changing the way people are rolling out applications. So you know, game is over. Open source is won. Open core is winning. And this is where the people are confused. This is why, why I got you guys here. What's the difference between mm -hmm. open source and open core? What's yeah. the big deal? Why is this so important? Yeah, yeah, no, great, great question. So really like the difference between open source and open core, um, it comes down to, uh, I guess really it's, it's a business model, right? So um, open core uh, contains open source software, right? That, that's 100% that's true, right? So usually what will happen is a company will take um, a, a project um, that is open source that has an existing community around it or they've built it or they've contributed it or however that's kind of that genesis has happened. And then what they'll do is they'll look at all the edges around that open source project and they think, what are some enterprise features that don't exist in the open source project that we can build ourselves and then sprinkle those around the edges and sell that as a proprietary offering, right? So what you get is you get the core functionality is powered by an open source project and quite often the code is identical, right? But there's all these kind of little features around the outside uh, that you know might make it a little bit easier to use in an enterprise environment, right? Or might make it a bit easier to do you know, some operation side of things. And they'll charge you a license for that, right? So you end up in a situation where you might've adopted the open source project but then now if you want, you know, feature X, Y, or Z, you know, you then need to go and, and fork over some money and, you know, go into that whole licensing kind of contract, right? So that's the core difference between uh, open core and open source, right? Open core, it's got all these little proprietary bits kind of sprinkled around the outside. So how would you describe your platform for your customers? Obviously you guys are succeeding, your growth is great, we're going to get in that in a second. But as you guys have been steadily expanding the platform, of open source data technologies, what is what is the main solution that you guys are offering customers? Managing open source technologies, what's the main value that you guys yeah. bring to the customer? Yeah, definitely. So, so really the main value that we bring to the customer is we allow them to, I guess, successfully adopt open source databases or database technologies, right? Without having to go down that open core path, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, open core can be quite attractive uh, but what it does mean is you end up with all these kind of like, you know, mini oracles, right? Or still having, you know, to, to, to pay the toll, right? In terms of license fees, right? What we do, however, is we take those open source projects and we deliver that as a database as a service on our managed platform, right? So mm -hmm. we take care of all the operations, the pain, the care, the feeding, patch management, backups, everything that you need to do, right? Whether you're running it yourself or getting someone else to run it, we'll do, take care of that for you, right? but we do it with the pure upstream open source version, right? So that means you get full flexibility, full portability, and more importantly, you're not paying those expensive license fees, right? Plus it's easy, it just works, right? You get that full cloud native experience yeah. uh, and you know you get your database right now when you need it. And basically you guys solve the problem of one, I got this you know, legacy or existing license technology I got to pay for, and it may not be enabling modern applications, and they don't have a team to go do all the work, right? Or some companies have like a whole army of people just embedded in open source, that's very rare. So it sounds like yeah, you guys do yeah. both. Did I get that right? Is that right? You have to do the yeah, so def Yeah, definitely. So we definitely enable it if you don't have that capability yourself, right? You know, 
we're, we're the outsourced option to that, right? It's obviously a lot more than that, but it's one of those pressures that companies nowadays face, right? And if, you, if we take it back to that uh, concept of developer velocity, right? Um, you know, you, you really want them working on your core business problems. You don't want them having to fight database infrastructure, right? So you've also got the opportunity cost of having your existing engineers working on running this stuff themselves or running a proprietary or an open core solution themselves when really you should be outsourcing, you know, preferably to InstaCluster, but hey, let's be honest, you know, you should be outsourcing it to anyone yeah. um, so that your engineers can be focusing on your core business problems, right? Um, and, and really letting them uh, work on the things that make you money, right? It's very smart. You guys have a great business model because one of the things we've been reporting on theCUBE on SiliconANGLE as well, is that the database market is becoming so diverse for the right reasons. You know, databases are everywhere now and code is, you know, becoming horizontally scalable for the cloud, but vertically specialized with machine learning. So you're seeing applications and new new database. No one database rules the world anymore. It's not about Oracle anymore or anything else. So open source fits nicely into this kind of platform view. How do you guys decide which technologies go in to the platform that you support? Yeah, great, great question. So we certainly live in a world of um, you know, I, I call it polyglot persistence, um, but you know, a simple way of, of, of referring that to that is uh, the right tool for the right job, right? Um, and so, you know, we really live in this world where engineers will reach for a database that solves a specific problem and solves it well, right? As, as you mentioned, you know, companies, they're no longer Oracle shops or they're no longer MySQL shops, right? You know, you'll quite often see services or applications or teams using two or three different databases to solve different challenges, right? And so what we do at InstaCluster is we really look at what are the technologies that our existing customers are using um, and using side by side with say some of the existing InstaCluster offerings. We take great lead from that. We also look at what are the different projects out there that are solving use cases that we don't address at the moment, right? So it's very use case driven, right? Whether it's, hey, we need something that's better at say, time series, or we need something that's a little bit better at uh, translytical workloads, right? Or something that's a better bit of a better fit for a cache, right? Um, and we work with those. And I think importantly, we also have this view that <clears throat> in a world of polyglot persistence, right? You've also got data in integration challenges, right? So how do you keep data sync between these two different database types, right? So we're also looking at how do we integrate those better and support our users on that particular uh, that particular journey, right? So it, it really comes down to one, listening to your customers, seeing what's out there and what's the right use case for a given um, technology. And then we look to adopt that. That's great. Ben, machine learning is completely on fire right now. People love it. They want more of it. AI is AI everything. Everyone's putting AI on every label. If it does any automation, it's magic, it's AI. So it really, <laughs> we know what that's happening. It's just really database work and machine learning under the covers. Uh, Pete, the business model here is completely changes too, because now with open source as a platform, you have more scale, you have differentiation opportunities. Uh, I'm sure business is doing great. Give us an update on the business side of InstaCluster. Insta what's clicking for you guys? What's working? Uh, what's what's the success trajectory look like? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been an, an amazing journey for us. I mean, when you think about it, we founded in 2013. So we're eight years into our journey. When we started the business, we were uh, focused entirely on Cassandra, but as you talk, you know, as Ben talked about, we've gone and diversified those technologies onto the platform, that common experience that we offer customers. So you can adopt any one of a number of open source technologies in a highly integrated way and really, really grow off the back of that. Um, is, you know, it, it's driving some phenomenal growth in our business. And, you know, we've really enjoyed um, sort of growth rates that have been you know, sort of 70, 80, 100% year on year since we, we've started the business. And that's been, you know, that's led to an enormous scale and opportunities for us to invest further in the platform, invest further in additional technologies in a really highly opinionated way. I think Ben talked about that, you know, that, that view on integrations and that becomes incredibly complex as you have many, many kind of offerings on the platform. So InstaCluster is much more targeted in terms of how we want to take our business forward and the growth opportunity before us. I mean, we, we think about being deeply expert and deeply capable in a smaller subset of technologies that those which actually integrate 
and interoperate for customers so they can build solutions in you know for their applications but do that on instacluster using its platform with that common experience and you know so we've grown to sort of 270 people now around the world we started in australia we've got a strong presence in the us we recently acquired a business called creditive in 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 europe uh which was a postgres specialist organization and that was because you know as ben said before talking about those technologies we bring onto a platform postgres huge market disrupting oracle you know exactly the right place that we want to be as instacluster with pure open source offerings we we brought them into the instacluster family much this year and we did that to accelerate it on our platform and you know so we think about that we think about future technologies on that platform what we can do uh, and introduce to even provide a you know an even greater and richer experience cadence is new to our platform super exciting for us because not only is it kind of uh something that uh you know provides workflow as code as a as an open source experience but as a glue technology to build kind of complex kind of business logic for applications it actually drives workloads across Cassandra, Postgres, uh, and Kafka, which are kind of core technologies on our platform. Super exciting for us, a big market, interesting kind of a you know group of adopters. You've got Uber kind of leading the charge there with that and us partnering with them now. Uh, we see that as a massive growth opportunity for our business. And as we introduce um, you know, analytics capabilities, exploration, visibility features into the platform, all built on open source. So you can build a complete kind of top to bottom kind of data services layer using open source technology for your platform. We think that's an incredibly exciting part of the business and a great opportunity for us. Opportunities to raise money, acquisition, more acquisitions on the horizon? Well, I think acquisitions where it makes sense. I mean, you know, I talked about creditive where, where we looked at, uh, at creditive, we knew the Postgres a mature market and we were coming to that market reasonably late so you know the way we thought about that from a strategy perspective was we wanted to accelerate the richness of the capability on our platform that we introduced and became ga last late last year uh, so we think about when we're selecting that kind of technology you know that's the perfect opportunity to consider an acquisition for us uh, so as we look at what we're going to introduce in the platform over the next sort of two three four years that's that sort of decision that will, or that sort of thinking or frames our thinking on what we would do from an acquisition perspective. I think the other way we think about acquisitions is new markets. Um, you know, so thinking about globally, you know, entry say into the Japanese market, does that make sense because of, you know, kind of in language requirements to be able to support customers? Because one of the things that's really, really important to us is, you know, the platform's fantastic for scaling, growing, deploying, running, operating this very powerful open source technology. But so too is the importance of having deep operational open source expertise kind of backing and being there to call on if a customer is having an application issue. And that, that kind of drives the need for us to have in-country kind of market support. Uh, and so when we think about those sort of opportunities, I think we think about acquisition there as a, like another string to the bow in terms of getting, yeah. getting presence in, in a particular or an emerging market that we're interested in. Awesome. Ben, final question to you is on the technology front, what do you see this year emerging? A lot of changes in 2021. We got another year of pandemic situation going on. Hopefully it goes by fast. Uh, hopefully it won't be three years, but again, who knows? But yeah. you're seeing the cloud open source actually taking as a tailwind from the pandemic. New, new opportunities, companies are refreshing. They have to, they're forced. There's going to be a lot mm. more changes. What do you see as a, uh, from a tech perspective in open source, open core, and in general for large companies as open source continues to power the innovation? Yeah, I, so de definitely, you know, the pandemic as a tailwind, um, you know, particularly for those co uh, companies adopting the cloud, right? Uh, you know, I think it's forced a lot of their hands as well. You know, their five-year plans have certainly become two or three-year plans. Um, around moving to the cloud. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, that contest for talent uh, means that, you know, you, you really want to be um, keeping your engineers focused on core things. Um, so definitely, I think we're going to see a continuation of that. We're going to see the continuation of um, open source, you know, dominating when it comes to uh, database and the database market, the same with cloud. Uh, you know, I think we're going to see the, you know, the gradual march towards uh, different adoption models within the cloud. So, you know, serverless, 
right? Um, you know, I think we're going to see that kind of slowly mature. I think it's still a little bit early in, in, in the hype cycle there, but we're going to start to see that mature. Um, on the ML AI side of things as well, you know, it's people have been talking about it for the last three or four years. And I'm sure to people in the industry, they're like, oh, you know, we're over that. But I think on the broader industry, we're still quite early in that particular cycle as people figure out how do they use the data that they've got, right? How, how do they use that? How do they train models on that? How do they serve inference on that, right? And how do they unlock other things with lower down on their data stack um, as well when it comes to, you know, ML and, and, and AI, right? You know, we're seeing great research papers come out from, you know, AI powered indexes, right? So the AI is actually speeding up queries, let alone actually solving business problems, right? So. I think we're going to see more and more of that kind of come out. I think we're going to see more and more process capabilities and organizational responses to this explosion of data. Um, super excited to see people talking about concepts and organizational concepts like data mesh, right? I think that's going to be fundamental as we move forward yeah. and have to manage the complexities of dealing with this, right? So it's you know, it's an old industry data, you know, when you think about it, um, you know, as soon as you had computers, you had data and, and it's an old industry from that perspective. Um, but I, I feel like we're only just getting started and it's just heating up. Um, so super excited to see what uh, 2022 holds for us. Every company will be an open source AI company. It has to be no matter what. <laughs> well, well, thanks yeah. for sharing the data, Pete and Ben, the co-founders of InstaCluster. We'll get our Cube AI working on this data we got today from you guys. Thanks for sharing, great stuff. Um, thanks for sharing the open core um, perspective. Really appreciate it and congratulations on your success. Companies do need uh, more InstaClusters out there. You guys are doing a great job. Thanks for coming on, appreciate it. Thanks, John. Cheers, mate. Thanks, John. Cube conversation Bye -bye. here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching. <laughs>